So in this series, we're going to look at how we can study quantum mechanics using some computational methods. Quantum mechanics is governed by a single differential equation called the Schrodinger equation. Unfortunately, like you've probably learned in a differential equations class, most differential equations, including the Schrodinger equation, cannot be solved exactly, meaning you can't arrive at a nice, neat function at the end to have an analytical solution that you can just write down as a nice, neat function, put a little bow on it, and say this is the answer. Instead, we need to transform our differential equation into what's called a difference equation. This is the exact same approximation you're making when you turn a derivative into a slope, or when you turn an integral into a Riemann sum, you turn a differential equation into a difference equation. It's the exact same kind of approximation. Once we have our difference equation, we'll be able to feed that into a computer that can solve the Schrodinger equation iteratively. Now, the Schrodinger equation has some other complexities to it. Quite literally, it's a complex equation. So to help you learn how to use difference equations and feed them into a computer, we're going to start with a different differential equation. We're going to start with the heat equation. The basic idea of the heat equation is that you've got a metal rod here. Uh, let's say it goes from x equals 0 over to x equals L. So L is just the length of the rod. Uh, the goal is to be able to study the temperature as a function of the position and time in the rod. So u of x and t here is the temperature. So you might have a different temperature at different points in the rod. So for example, let's say I have a, let's say I have a, a heat source somewhere here in the middle. Maybe I put a candle underneath the, underneath the metal rod. And I get a very high temperature up here in the middle, and I get a lower temperature out here near the ends. That would be an example of a temp temperature distribution I could have in the metal rod there. The heat equation tells me that this temperature is governed by a couple of derivatives. So if I take the derivative of u with respect to time, so that's how much the temperature is changing at each point per unit time, that's going to be proportional to the second derivative of u with respect to position times a positive constant out here. It's just an a squared so that we make sure we enforce that this is a positive number over here. Basically what that means is that if I've got a maximum somewhere, so like here you've got a maximum with respect to position, right? We're just going to take a, we're going to freeze a snapshot with respect to time here. If I have a maximum here, that means that my second derivative here, my concavity, right? Because the second derivative is the concavity with respect to space. That means my concavity would be negative, right? So if my concavity is negative, that means du dt should be negative, which means I should expect my temperature to decrease here. So this just indicates whether the temperature is going to increase or decrease. That's all the differential equation is saying. Similarly, over here, you we might, let's say we had a Gaussian distribution where over here, this, uh, this part of the temperature function was concave up. I'd have a positive concavity, and that means I would expect the temperature to increase. And that matches your intuitive sense, right? We expect temperature to get lower here and higher here because we expect heat to flow from the center out to the edges. So this differential equation tells me what I already know intuitively, but it gives me a way to solve it quantitatively. I can arrive at a mathematical solution for this. The way you set up a problem uh, with differential equation like this is that you provide some sort of boundary conditions. So you might provide boundary conditions of, let's say, the temperature at the left edge and the temperature at the right edge have to be kept constant, right? Maybe they have to be kept at the temperature of the surrounding room. Uh, and so you've got x set equal to 0, x set equal to L, but you're still allowing t to vary. So this boundary condition has to be true for all points in time, or all moments in time, that you're interested in. The other thing you would specify would be the initial condition, which would be u of x at 0 equal to some shape that you provide, right? So you might make it a Gaussian, you might make it a sine squared or a cosine squared, something like that. But the important thing is that you have a boundary condition that has to be true for all time, and an initial condition that has to be true at time t equals 0. 
So here we're freezing out x and letting time vary. Here we're, fr we're freezing out time and letting x vary. And so the way you would transform this differential equation into a difference equation is through a simple prescription. The first thing you do is you take the rod itself and you divide it up into spaces. We're going to call those spaces the grid, right? because you can extend this idea to two dimensions and have a, what we would traditionally call the grid, or you could extend it to three dimensions and have a three-dimensional grid. Each point on this grid is spaced apart from its neighbors by a distance dx, right? right? This is just like a step size that you would have in the euler kromer method or in numerical integration. We're going to call this thing dx. And we're going to replace x with x with an index j. So this just means the jth point along the grid. So this would be j0, this would be j1, j2, j3, on and on up to however many points you have for j. Then we got to do the same thing for t. We're going to take t, transform it into specific moments in time. So you can think of this thing as being like a grid. You can think of this thing as being like animation frames. So just like we do in the euler kromer method, when you want to iterate a solution forward, you've got to have a time step. These frames are going to be separated by a time step dt. So we've really got two step sizes we have to worry about. We have the spatial step dx, and we have the time step dt. So we're taking x, splicing it up into a grid. We're taking the time and splicing that up into animation frames. So in each one of these frames, this heat distribution, this temperature distribution, is going to look a little bit different. It's going to be like frames in a video. The next piece that I need to transform is my temperature, because my temperature is a function of x and t, but I'm transforming x into a thing that's got an index j, and t into a thing that's got an index k. What that means is that my u needs to have two indices. It needs to have a j to indicate what x value you were at, and a k to indicate what t value you were at. So u is just going to be u, j, k. Now in principle, you should put a comma there to be nice and neat. I will sometimes forget to put the comma, or I will just be writing too fast to put the comma. But the important thing is it's two numbers. The first one indicates the x value, k indicates the t value. The next thing we need to do is start transforming our derivatives, because u never really enters this equation directly. I have a derivative with respect to time, and a second derivative with respect to x. To do that, I just use the slope approximation. So this, we're just going to make the change in u over the change in t. So du dt is going to transform into, I need a change in u up at the top. So I'll have a u j k plus 1. So I'm going to move it forward in time one step, minus u j k. All right, so I've got the next u value forward in time minus the current u value in time. Notice that I'm leaving j the same. So j needs to stay the same when I'm taking a derivative with respect to t. Because I'm not taking a derivative with respect to x. I'm not worried about changes in x. I'm worried about changes in t. Then I need to divide by how much time passes. Well, how much time passes from one frame to the next? Time step dt up here. So I'm going to divide by dt. Pretty straightforward, right? You've seen this kind of approximation before for the slope. Now for the d squared u dx squared, the second derivative, it gets a little more nuanced because this is now a second derivative. So for a second derivative, d squared u dx squared, I have to do something similar, but it's going to have a few more pieces to it. So the first thing we're going to notice is that k needs to stay the same. Right? Because this is a variation in x, not a variation in t. So k is going to stay the same. Now j is going to be the index that changes. Here's what I need to do. I need to go to the right one point, uj plus 1. Okay. Then I need to go to the left one point, uj minus 1. Okay. Right? So imagine you're at this point here. If you want the second derivative, you need to look one point to the left and one point to the right. So this is going to be k 
k plus 1. This is going to be k minus 1. Then I need to subtract off the middle point. So I need to subtract off u, j, comma, k. And since I'm taking two differences, right, I'm taking two derivatives, or I'm taking the, distance, the difference between this point in here and the difference between this point in here, I actually need to multiply this thing by 2. So it kind of looks like a squared FOIL problem where you've got the, the first term, the last term, and then the outside and inside terms pick up a 2 along the way. That's how I imagine it in my head. That's kind of what's going on. Basically, you're applying this rule twice. Then I need to divide by the change in x between those points squared, right? Because this is a second derivative, the denominator is going to have units of my step size in x squared. So that's the major difference. They've got basically the same structure. You've got a difference up at the top, a difference up at the top, and then the change in the independent variable here, the change in the independent variable here. The difference is this one has four pieces up here, one of which gets a two, so it's two pieces in one, and this piece down here gets squared. Now that I've got that recipe in place, it's time to transform the differential equation itself. So we're going to take our heat equation, du dt equals positive number d squared u dx squared. And now I just need to make each of these substitutions into the differential equation, and then I will have a difference equation. So the first thing we'll do, the du dt gets replaced by u j k plus 1 minus u j, k. And basically everything has a u on it. The only thing you really have to keep track of is the indices. Divide that by dt and equal a squared. And I have this long piece up here. u, j plus 1, k plus u, j minus 1, k minus 2, u, j, k divided by dx squared. And now when we get into the thick of the algebra here, one important thing to keep in mind is that these two pieces always have to be treated the same, right? Because a step to the left and a step to the right is the same in the physical universe, right? Because I can just flip the axes around and I would have the same problem. So whatever I do to the uj plus 1, I also need to do the uj minus 1. That's just that's a feature you're going to see anytime you work with a difference equation. So now we've taken our differential equation. We've turned it into a difference equation, right? This thing no longer has any derivatives. This thing just has differences, right? There's a difference up here. There's a difference up here. Step size, step size. That's another type of difference. The important thing is this has the same information as the original differential equation, right? This one says that if you have a maximum, if you have a u that is higher than both of its neighbors, you should expect that u to decrease. Okay, same thing here. Let's suppose you have a u. This is, the, this is the, the local point u. These are the neighboring points u. If you have this u higher than those other two u's, then this whole thing is going to be negative, and you would expect the next point to be lower than the current point. It has the same information, all that same common sense, intuitive understanding that you had of temperature in a rod. This is just now stating it in terms of individual pieces of the rod or individual slices of the rod and individual moments forward in time. The next part that we need to do is turn this into a form that the computer can work with because if you just put this into a if you just put this line in a computer it's, it's not going to know what to do with it. What we need to do is solve for this piece. Because take a look at the indices, right? The way these indices are working, this is the value of u at the current point, at the current point that you're looking at in the rod, at the next moment in time. This is the value of the temperature at the point you're looking at at the current moment in time. Current moment in time, current moment in time, current moment in time. This is the only term that's got the next moment in time. Because what that means is if I know the u at one moment in time, I can get u at the next moment in time just by solving for this thing. Okay, let's see how that works. So we want to get this thing by itself. So we are going to multiply both sides by dt. It's pretty much basic algebra. So I've got a u, j comma k plus 1. I'm going to equal, let's just collect all of the constants here. I've got an a squared. I'll have a dt coming over to this side. I'll have a dx squared on the bottom. 
times all of this stuff, right? U j plus 1k plus u j minus 1k minus 2u jk. Get myself a little border there. All right, so I've got this difference needs to equal this piece over here. So I've collected all of the constants over here, and then I've got the pieces over here, the pieces of the temperature function over here. Then all I would need to do would be to add this over to this side. So with a little bit of erasing of the equal sign there, I've got u j comma k plus this piece. And this is exactly the same type of approximation that you see when you do numerical integration or when you solve an ordinary differential equation, right? You have the next value equals the current value plus some amount that it changes by, right? That's been true since ninth grade. Whenever you first saw delta x over delta t, this has been true, that the next value equals the current value plus the change. Here's the current value. Here's the change in the value of u. And again, it has all the same information as up here. Because if I have a point that is a maximum, if I've got a temperature value that is higher than its neighbors, if this u is bigger than this uj plus 1 and uj minus 1, then this whole thing will be negative, because this negative term is going to win out. That means that this thing is going to have this value subtracted from, so this k plus 1 value is going to be smaller than the k value. Or Take the other example, if I've got a minimum, if I've got a ujk, if I've got a u value at one point that is lower than its two neighbors, here's the two neighbors, here's this value, then this whole thing is going to be positive, right, because I'll have two positives minus a smaller positive, or I'll have two values minus a smaller value, you don't have to be positive, then I'm adding to this thing, right, and so then my uk plus 1 is going to be bigger than my uk. And I know at this point you're scratching your head saying, that's great, but how do I get that uj to begin with? Right? Because you're assuming you know all these UJs. That's where this initial condition comes in. That's why to solve a difference equation problem, you've got to have an initial shape of the function. So here's what we do. We're going to start with k equals 0. Right? So if I start with k equals 0, then I've got uj comma 1, right, if k equals 0, then k plus 1 is 1, my next time step is 1, equals uj 0 plus a squared dt over dx squared uj plus 1, 0 plus uj minus 1, 0 minus 2uj 0. Everybody over here has a time index of 0. And I know what u at time index 0 is, which means all I need to do is iterate over the j values, right? Start at the leftmost, no, my drawing's gone. All I need to do is start at the leftmost value and move to the next one, then move to the next one, move to the next one, all the way along the grid. And I can figure out what all of the uj's are at 1. Once I've got that, I can plug in 1 where I have zeros over here, so I can have a uj1. A uh, uj plus 1, 1, a uj minus 1, 1, a uj 1, and then I can get uj 2. Then I can replace these 1s with 2s, replace this 2 with a 3. I can keep iterating forward. That is a lot of calculations to do, but it's something that I can program a computer to do, right? That's what we call a loop. So the goal is you take this equation and you just loop over it. And you can do that for as long as you want. Well, you can do it for as long as you want, as long as the solution is stable. We'll worry about that another time. But this is the thing that I can plug into the computer, have it loop over, and go from u of x at 0 to u at x at any time that I want. So here's our code where we've implemented our difference equation. First, we're going to set up the initial state. Remember, this is the thing that determines how the temperature function evolves in time. So we're just using a, a, an exponential here, a Gaussian, centered around x equals 2.5. So you're going to see a peak at 2.5. Uh, and then it'll trail off uh, from there. Uh, we're going to set the length of the rod to be 6. And I actually set up the x min and x max a little bit different here. We're going to go from negative L over 2 to L over 2. The code works the same way regardless. It's going to take, it's going to start at x min, go up to x max. Here we set our dx and dt. Um, you notice I've made the dx a little bit bigger and the dt a little bit smaller. 
Um, you can usually get away with having those be of different magnitudes like that. And just for simplicity, we're going to have an A equals 1. Then we come down here and we've got the iterative calculation. So the way this is set up, here is our difference equation that we got at the end of the chalkboard time. So we need to have the next value equal to the current value plus the change. Now you notice we're storing these in different lists here, next u and u, because I've got to keep referencing other values of u. So I can't change uh, the current value of u because then I need that for this u j minus 1 term on the next term on the list. And so what we've got here is, uh, is the change over here. So we've got all the constants a squared times dt over dx squared like we had on the board. And then here we've got this derivative piece. So this is just the numerator of that second derivative, the uj plus 1, the u to the right, plus the u to the left, minus 2 times u at the current point. And then we're going to add on to that uj. So this is our difference equation. This is the differential equation just written in difference equation form. And so we're looping over t here, and basically each time we go around the loop, we're going to replace u with the next u value. So next becomes current on the next go around. And basically each time we go around, we're going to redraw the graph so that we get a nice animated graph. Let's click run and see what happens. Now we expected the peak to decrease and the other parts to increase, and that's exactly what we get. We saw our peak at 2.5 begin to decrease. You notice it's also moving to the left a little bit. We can sit here and watch this thing move to the left progressively more. As temperature kind of gets transferred from one point to another, temperature doesn't really transfer like that. It's, it's energy that's moving, it's internal energy, uh, but temperature is how you measure that. So we've got the peak from over there, moving over to the left here. Let's see what happens if we move that peak farther to the left to begin with. You'll notice we don't get as drastic a shift to the left. Um, we do still get a decrease in that peak, just like you would expect. We don't get quite the, uh, don't get quite the shift over uh, of the peak as much. And in fact, if we make this centered around the midpoint, we won't see it shift at all. We'll see it drop, right? You can see the temperature kind of normalizing across the bar, uh, but the peak is not moving left or right because there's no preferred direction for it to move. Now, of course, you don't have to stick with an exponential there. I could have an exponential centered around uh, 1.5, and then let's make another one centered around negative 1.5, so we'll have two peaks here. Let's watch what happens with those. So my two peaks should each come downward, and I have a minimum in the middle that needs to come upward, right? Because if I have these two neighboring points higher than this point, then this whole thing should be positive and I should get an increase there. Let's click run again, it goes a little bit fast there. So you see my peaks come down, my trough goes up. So the thing is kind of, it's almost like it's normalizing the temperature or trying to approach a uniform temperature, which you know is ultimately what happens with temperature. Temperature tends to level out in equilibrium. That's what we're approaching here. So with these peaks coming lower and the troughs going higher, it's almost as if there's some thing that's being conserved in the problem. And you know that that's going to be the kinetic energy of the atoms in the rod, that this, uh, this differential equation is capturing that conservation of energy, even though we're not modeling individual atoms. Let's take a look at how our setup of the difference equation also changes it. Let's see what happens if we increase our time step. This is going to cost us some accuracy. You notice it moves faster. Uh, but we don't get quite as good of an accuracy, especially if we bump this up to a 0 0.1. Let's see what happens. You notice now it's much choppier. See, this is not really acceptable data. We know we're not going to get a negative 10 to the negative 76 temperature. That's not going to happen. Uh, let's see what happens if we if we split the difference on those values. Yeah, that's still not good enough. This shows you that that finite uh, this this difference equation approach is very sensitive to these step sizes, right? So as you play around with these, you may get some messy data. You want to avoid that, right? You want to adjust these until you get some nice, clean data over here. So anyway, I hope that's a useful introduction to you for, uh, for this difference equation method. I know it's something new, it's something different, but really you can use this to study any differential equation. And next time we're gonna apply this to the Schrodinger equation, the differential equation for quantum mechanics.